Well, hello, and welcome to your first of two videos on the federal judicial system. We also call it the judiciary or the federal court system. Um, first, let's start off with a little bit of information about courts in general, all courts, in our system. Um, it's important to understand that they are both political and legal institutions, and um, by that I mean Yes, they are part of the political system, and we talk about them that way a lot in political science. But they're a bit different than Congress and the presidency in a number of ways because they are legal institutions. So let's talk about what that means just for a minute. How are they the same as the other political institutions? Well, they make authoritative decisions about who gets what, when, and how, basically the definition of politics. Uh, they settle controversies, and many of those controversies are, in fact, political issues. Um, they choose winners and losers, and, and their decisions involve discretion, and they do have a human element to them. Um, but, and, and all that is true of Congress and the presidency and the federal bureaucracy, but they are different. Legal uh, Courts are different because they are legal institutions, which means they have certain characteristics. One is um, they are basically passive. They can't pick and choose the subjects they want to decide. They have to wait until cases are brought to them by actual real parties, real plaintiffs, real defendants, real people, and they don't get to shape and create their own um, business. Whereas Congress can do that anytime they want. They can just, you know, pass a law on something. Uh, secondly, courts are retrospective rather than prospective. Me, what, by, what I, by that, I just simply mean they make decisions about things that have already happened. They are deciding a controversy between a plaintiff and a defendant, between a, an injured party and an um, a, accused party, where the facts have already happened. And you know, when Congress is different in the president, they, they make decisions today for the future, as opposed to making a decision about the past. And also courts have to apply rules. They can't just make whatever decision they want. They can't just do whatever is politically expedient at the moment. They need to apply rules and they have to, and they reason in a particular way. Um, they have to use precedent, in other words, uh, laws and prior decisions that they apply to the current controversy. So it limits their, what you might call their creativity to decide cases in an original manner. And also, particularly in the federal system, because they have lifetime appointments, these judges are relatively isolated from things like elections, interest group lobbying, and, and even public opinion. So, and that was intentional. That is the way the federal judiciary was set up. So they would be independent from politics, at least to some extent. On the other hand, they're appointed by presidents and confirmed by the Senate. They come from political parties and, and therefore they're not completely independent of politics at all but they do have a certain insulation from consequences. You, it's not easy to get rid of a judge, in other words, as it might be to, you know, to vote your own representative out of office. We don't get to vote for federal judges at all. Um, and they decide major political and social controversies in our country, uh, especially the federal uh, courts. You may have heard of Alexis de Tocqueville, a French diplomat who traveled around the world in 1831, wrote a famous book called Democracy in America, and he pointed out, even back then, as he said, there's almost no political question in the U.S. that is not resol uh, resolved sooner or later into a judicial question. Um, it's just in the nature of our open court system that many different types of controversies, political controversies that would be decided by legislatures or executives, can be turned into court cases that get decided by judges. So, you know, the courts are one more avenue for people to pursue to try to change public policy. That was true in 1831, and it's true today. Um, many controversial political issues are decided in this country by judges. So here's where we're going to go with these, these two um, videos. In this one, I'm going to go over the, the facts of our system, which which is peculiar in the sense that we have literally two court systems. We have a federal court system and then we have 50 state court systems. So federal courts and state courts. And I'm going to try to show you how they relate to each other. We'll talk about how the federal courts are organized and about their history. You know, how they, how, how they evolved over time. 
in the second, um, and I, that, that will include a discussion of the, the jurisdiction of the federal courts. And then I'm going to expand on this whole question of how the federal courts are organized in the second video. In the second video, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to mention that in the first one, but I'm going to go into it in detail in the second. The three levels of federal courts, district courts, courts of appeal, the U.S. Supreme Court. We'll talk about judicial review and some suggestions for making the courts work better. Okay, let's talk about this concept of two court systems. Um, we have one federal court system that covers every square inch of the United States. There is not one square inch of the U.S. that is not within the jurisdiction of some federal court. But we also have 50 state court systems, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, etc. Each one has its own state court system. So it's also true that every square inch of the country is also within the jurisdiction of some state court. So how the heck does that work? How can you have two court systems in the same area? And I'm going to explain that. Um, basically, the federal courts apply U.S. law all over the country, everywhere. And in certain types of cases that we call diversity of citizenship cases, which I will explain, they sometimes apply the law of the state in which they're located, if that is the, the relevant law. But normally they apply federal law, which is the same all across the country. Um, and occasionally it can happen that the same incident can be both a state case and a federal case. Now that doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. So that, for example, if someone were to rob a bank in downtown Chicago, that person could be prosecuted under federal bankruptcy laws because the federal government outlaws bank robbery because the federal government insures the bank deposits. And, and the person might be found guilty or not guilty in a federal court, but they could also be prosecuted for bank robbery in the courts of the state of Illinois. And the fact that we have a double jeopardy rule in the Constitution doesn't preclude that. This can still, they can still be prosecuted twice for the same crime if it's done in separate courts. And that's something called the separate sovereignty rule. The state government has the right to prosecute them, so does the federal government. And sometimes that actually happens. Now, briefly on federal court organization, which again, I will go into in much more detail in the second video. The federal court system has three levels. The bottom level is the trial courts. That's where cases originate. They're called the district courts. Uh, if someone loses in their district court, they can appeal to what are called the circuit courts of appeal. That's the middle level appellate courts. They decide almost all appeals. And the very top level is the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, um, this is also the way most state court systems are organized. They don't have to be, but most of them are. Um, and as I'm going to explain, the federal courts have two types of cases that they hear. One is called federal question cases, which is cases that arise under federal law. And the other is diversity of citizenship cases where the plaintiff and the defendant are from different states. Don't worry, I'm going to explain all this later. But everything else is a state case. Now here's some terminology. Plaintiff and defendant. The plaintiff is the one who files the case claiming to have been injured and wanting damages or payment from the defendant. In, in the case of a criminal case, the plaintiff is the government and the defendant is the accused. In a civil case, they're both private citizens. And the defendant is the one the plaintiff accuses of causing the harm. So plaintiff, defendant. Um, also understand there's a difference between criminal and civil law. In criminal law, the government is the plaintiff and at stake, you know, what they're trying to get usually is loss of freedom for the plaintiff. But in a civil case, it's two private parties who sue each other and it's usually about money. We also have public versus private law, many different types of public law, criminal law, constitutional law, administrative law, and, the, and private law, contracts, torts, divorces, wills, most of the things that people do in their daily private lives. And then another concept I want you to understand is judicial review. That is the power of a court to compare a law, to look at a, a law or a decision made by um, a president or a governor, and to compare that law or that action with the constitution of that state or the U.S. Constitution. And they, that's called judicial review. And it includes the power of a court to declare the law invalid or to nullify the action of the executive official. 
because they do not comply with the Constitution. And we call that a declaration of the law being unconstitutional. That is judicial review. It is a power that courts have in our system and it makes them quite powerful. Now, some of the issues that they, that they um, um, talk about, we're, you know, we're gonna deal with some of them, but many of them um, could also, many of these key issues could also be decided by state courts. So um, the, uh, uh, the, now we, we need to talk a bit about how the state courts and the federal courts relate to each other and don't step on each other's toes deciding the same questions in different ways, right? So two systems. Now understand though, the state courts came first. We had state courts in colonial times when they were colonies, they were colonial courts. We had state courts under the Articles of Confederation and the federal courts weren't created until 1787 by the US Constitution. Um, and you know, the, these, these now originally 13, now 50 state systems, you know, they're all organized a little bit differently. But um, what happens when the states, or the people in a state court or, or in the states themselves, disagree with an interpretation of the US Supreme Court? Now, ordinarily, the US Supreme Court and federal law take precedence because of the supremacy clause in the US Constitution. So usually um, if the states want to do things one way um, and the federal government says it, it, it can't, the federal government prevails. So for example in Roe versus Wade when the Supreme Court decided that the US Constitution gives everyone the right to have uh, an abortion, all you know any uh, a pregnant person can uh, obtain an abortion under certain conditions um, that meant that in states where it was illegal, those laws became invalid. The, uh, the federal law takes precedence because of the supremacy clause and the constitution covers all of us. But there are some times when state courts can expand our rights beyond the scope of the US Supreme Court's decisions. So uh, how does that work? Um, sometimes this is called the new judicial federalism. Now here's where it comes up. Right now, and for quite some time, the U.S. Supreme Court is largely, is basically dominated by conservative Republicans. Um, and they, they are hostile towards certain types of claims, abortion rights, voting rights claims, other rights and liberties claims made by people. But there are plenty of states where there's strong support for expanding the rights of abortion or expanding voting rights or something of that sort, right? So what happens in those states? How can they go their own way and do it differently and have more rights for their citizens than the US Constitution provides according to the US Supreme Court? We call it the new judicial federalism. Um, it goes like this. The federal, federal law is supreme in its proper areas of jurisdiction, but a state Supreme Court can expand individual rights, like such as abortion rights or the rights of the accused beyond what the US Supreme Court has said is required if they base their decision entirely on state law and state constitutions. Because the final word on state constitutions is your state Supreme Court, not the US Supreme Court. The US Supreme Court is the final word on anything involving the US Constitution. But states can sometimes expand rights beyond what the Supreme Court has said the US Constitution requires if they base it entirely on their state constitution. So let's talk then about this division of labor, all right? Uh, state courts are the presumptive courts with jurisdiction over almost all civil and criminal cases. If you're gonna sue somebody, chances are you should be going into the state courthouse. Federal courts though have subject matter jurisdiction in two kinds of cases. And I'm gonna explain jurisdiction to you in just a minute here, but uh, jurisdiction is the power of a court to hear a case. Now remember, there's two kinds of federal, question, uh, federal jurisdiction. One, federal question jurisdiction, meaning the case arose under federal law. It's a federal law case. Two, diversity of citizenship. State, uh, the defendant and the plaintiff are from different states. I want to you know, talk with you just a bit about jurisdiction, what I mean by the term jurisdiction. It can mean geography, it can mean you know the crime has, the, or civil case arises within the state that it, or the federal judicial district that a court has control over. It could mean hierarchical, meaning original jurisdiction versus appellate. In other words, 
Uh, so it might be that one court is the place where you file the case originally when you first want to start the lawsuit. And then appellate jur jurisdiction is where you, uh, the court that has jurisdiction over the, the appeal you might take if you lose. And then there's also the question of personal jurisdiction, the court getting power over the defendant. But for now, we're really concerned about, let's talk just a moment about the hierarchical issue. Very, it sounds complicated, but it's actually very simple. It's just division of labor. Um, cases are filed or start in what's called a trial court or a court of original jurisdiction. In Illinois, it's the circuit courts. In the federal system, it's the district courts. And that's where they have trials. Facts are determined in trial courts. That's the court of original jurisdiction. <clears throat> now, the losing party at a trial can file an appeal. That appeal goes to a different court because the whole point is for a separate panel of judges to decide if the trial judge made a mistake. You know, we don't want the trial judge to decide themselves whether they made a mistake, right? So it's a different court. They're called appellate courts. And they decide whether the trial court applied and interpreted the law correctly. They don't retry the case. They just review the way the trial court judge did it. They have to interpret the laws or the statutes. They review the rulings made by the lower court, etc. So that's, that's what we mean by hierarchical jurisdiction. It's a big word, but it just means we have division of labor between trial courts and appellate courts. Pretty simple. Now, um, this, this federal system that we have, it, it is a really, I, I'm going to go through it um, briefly for you. Um, it, it, I, just a bit of its history, you know. And I don't expect you to become, you know, an expert historian on, on the history of the, of the federal courts, but some basic facts would be useful, like how did we end up here? Back in colonial times, before the revolution, um, there was what you might call a national court system for the 13 colonies. It was the British court system. You know, it was the courts of the king. The, the British crown, that was the national system. I mean, they, we were colonies of Great Britain and ultimately the courts back in um, London or their delegated uh, judges here in the, in the colonies uh, could make the, would make the decisions. They were the national court system, but there were also basically local courts as well. Now, after independence though, after the revolution, all of the 13 new states set up their own state court systems. And that's why I say state courts came first, because we did not have initially a national court system. Under the Articles of Confederation, we did not have federal courts. We had state courts. Now you can imagine how confusing that could get, because the state of Maryland might decide an issue one way, and the state of Virginia, their courts might decide it a different way. You could potentially have one piece of property in Virginia, a federal court might say it belonged to the plaintiff, and a, a court in the state next door might say the same piece of property belonged to the defendant. It, it, it was chaos. There was no national court system at all. So Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution created the U.S. Supreme Court and empowered Congress to create as many more national courts as they felt were necessary. And they immediately passed something. As soon as they got together in uh, January of 1789, uh, they began uh, to create federal courts. And they, the Judiciary Act of 1789 was the foundation for our current system. And then in 1803, the Supreme Court uh, created the Doctrine of Judicial Review and that made the courts a very important part of our constitutional system because they could declare acts of Congress or the president unconstitutional. Now let's just talk a bit about what happened at the Constitutional Convention about the courts. Um, understand that there was widespread agreement among the people at the Constitutional Convention that there had to be a federal court system. Remember, we didn't have one. They said, well, we know we need one. But the question is, how many courts and what would they be allowed to do? So the Federalists, the people who really pushed for a new constitution and a powerful federal government, they didn't like these state courts. They didn't trust them. They wanted uh, federal trial courts. They wanted a Supreme Court. They wanted federal trial courts. They wanted a whole system of federal courts. And they thought having one court system would be a great idea. But the Anti-Federalists wanted what we now sometimes call states' rights. They wanted strong state governments, and they wanted strong state courts, and they wanted a weak federal court system because they didn't want it to be able to overpower their local state courts. 
So Article 3 was a compromise. It created only the U.S. Supreme Court, but left it up to Congress to create other federal courts later. Now, why does this matter? Okay, it matters because, understand, Congress has control over the organization of the lower courts below the U.S. Supreme Court. They can make more of them, they can make fewer, they can change their jurisdiction, they can do a lot of things. They often are afraid to do that, but they can. Um, Article 3 of the Constitution provides that, as you can see here, the judicial power of the U.S. is vested in one Supreme Court and such inferior courts as Congress may establish. And note what it did with the judges. They, it says they hold their offices during good behavior. You know what that means? Unless they're impeached, they stay there for life. They stay there for life. They have life terms. They never run for re-election. They don't have to be reappointed. Once they're appointed, nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate, they never have to run again. They are there for life if that's what they want to do. Um, and uh, so let's talk for a minute uh, uh, about who these judges are, right? Now, um, who are the judges? Let's, let's take a look at the, the current snapshot from the American Constitution Society. This is the first is <clears throat> racial diversity. And you can see that uh, if you look at the pie chart, 71.5% of the federal judges in our system are white, 12% African American, and then you can see the breakdown of Latinx and uh, Asian, Native American, etc. So it is a predominantly white uh, judiciary. Now let's look at the gender diversity. As you can see, um, approaching two-thirds of the justices uh, of the courts, excuse me, the judges uh, uh, on the federal system are men. 60, about 65 percent and about 35 percent female. Now but if we look at this, you can see that it varies by president. Let me show you what I mean by that. This is the gender diversity of judges that were confirmed under Obama, Trump, and Biden. Look at the differences. Um, in in uh, When uh, Obama was president, 50, he, he appointed 58% uh, of the, the judges he appointed were men and 42% women. Look at Trump. Over three quarters of the judges that Trump appointed were men, and only fewer than one quarter women. Well, that's a bit shocking, isn't it? Now look at under Biden. It's the other way around. Almost three quarters of the judges that Biden has appointed are women and about one quarter men. So you see, when people say elections don't matter, I hear young people sometimes saying that, oh, you know, elections don't matter. It doesn't make any difference. Really? You know, as I know I've said this before, but I mean, really? It, you don't think it <laughs> doesn't make a bit of a difference who these judges are? And then let's take a look at the racial issue. Under Obama, 63% of the justices, of the judges he appointed were white. Under Trump, 84% were white. Only 3.8% of the judges that Trump appointed were black. Only 3.8% Latinx and so forth. You can see it on the pie chart. Look at Biden. No, ju no president in history has appointed such um, a diverse bench. Only 32% white. 24% African American, 15% Latino, etc. You can see the difference. So again, does it make a difference who gets elected and does it make a difference if you vote for president and, and senators? Uh, yeah, I would think so. Let's continue with Article 3. Now we know who the judges are. What is the judicial power of the federal courts? Now these are the ones that they get to handle. Everything else goes to the states. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to explain this to you. You don't have to memorize these words. I'm going to explain it. But note it says, um, the judicial power extends to all cases arising under the Constitution, the laws of the United States, etc. That's what we call federal question jurisdiction, cases that arise under federal law. You know, like a case that pertains to, for example, immigration. Immigration law is federal. Bankruptcy law, it's all federal law. A federal bankruptcy statute, etc. Those are called federal question cases. And the other is cases between citizens of different states. I'm going to explain that so you fully understand that. Don't worry. But that's called diversity of citizenship jurisdiction. So federal question, diversity of citizenship. Those cases go to the feds. Everything else goes to state courts. 
Um, <clears throat> and the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction is explained here. It says the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction in a very, very, in other words, you get to go there first in a tiny, tiny number of cases involving basically where states sue each other and this sort of thing. In everything else, the Supreme Court is a court of appellate jurisdiction. They hear appeals. Again, what is jurisdiction? Geographical, subject matter, hierarchical. Jurisdiction is the power of a court to decide a case. Remember I said I'd explain this in a little more detail. Here it comes. Hierarchical. The court with original jurisdiction is the one where the case is to be filed and tried. That is the trial court. That's all that means. Original jurisdiction means it originates there. It gets tried there. The court with appellate jurisdiction is the one that will decide any appeal that is taken from the decision of the trial court claiming that there were mistakes made. Subject matter jurisdiction. Okay, we're going to get into this a bit now. Uh, again, you know, states, normally if something happens in a state, it's presumed to be a state case, but federal government, the federal government has two kinds of subject matter jurisdiction. One, cases that must be decided by the application of federal law, laws from the U.S. Code, the U.S. Constitution, treaties, etc. I'll give you some examples, and the other being diversity. Okay. Here are some of the federal question uh, cases that are very common. Immigration and naturalization, federal drug laws, fraud, there are a lot of federal fraud laws, bankruptcy, federal civil rights laws, voting rights, patent claims, copyright infringement, things involving shipping. Those are federal question, federal law, federal questions. So the federal courts hear those. Diversity of citizenship, here are the rules. And the, there's a couple of these rules I want you to know. Number one, it is, how do we know we have diversity of citizenship? Now understand, I'm going to explain to you why we have this in just a moment. But first, just understand what it means. All the plaintiffs have to be from different states than all defendants. If you have any plaintiff from the same state as any defendant, you don't have diversity of citizenship. And in addition to that, there has to be more than $75,000 in damages at issue. And in this rare, in these cases, which is 25% of the civil docket of the federal courts, in these cases, the judge applies the law of the state where the facts occurred instead of federal law. Um, now, judges don't like this, uh, but you know many large corporations do. Why? Because in certain circumstances, you sue a big corporation. Let's say, let's say you're in California, and you sue, let's say, United Airlines, and I believe United Airlines is incorporated in Illinois. So their home is Illinois. They're citizens of Illinois. You, you, uh, they land a plane. Someone falls down off the plane in San Diego. So the San Diego uh, plaintiff sues them in California. Whoopee. Nope. The United Airlines will pull that case into a, in front of a, a big federal judge in a federal court because they'll say, wait a minute, we're not from the same state. We have diversity of citizenship. Now, why on earth do we have this? Well, here's why. Back in 1787, people thought that the courts of one state, the state courts, let's say of Maryland, would naturally favor citizens of Maryland over those of any other state. So they thought, you know, when at the Constitutional Convention, they thought, well, you know, we can't trust those Maryland courts if a Maryland plaintiff sues a Virginia defendant, you know, and, and, or vice versa. You can't, you can't be fair. If you've got a plaintiff and defendant from different states, then neither state's courts can be fair. So they thought, well, those cases where we have people from different states, plaintiffs and defendants, let's put those in the federal courts, and then the federal courts will be neutral. That's the whole idea of diversity of citizenship. Um, now, it's, it, it used to be very relevant back in those days. It may have been really true that Maryland courts couldn't be fair to citizens of Virginia and vice versa. But ask yourself, is that really true today? I mean, would you think it's true that Illinois judges couldn't be fair to Indiana uh, litigants? Is that really true? I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting question. Or, or are they, you know, so professional that that would really not be an issue? So, but let's show you how this works in practice. I'll give you some examples. A little game here. It, do we have federal court subject matter jurisdiction? Yes or no? And why? Now assume this is all just private citizens, all right? What if the plaintiff sues the defendant for infringing a copyright? Let's say the plaintiff wrote a song and recorded it and, and recorded their copyright with the federal government. 
And the defendant went out and took that very same song, stole it, and made a record, made a bunch of money off it. Plaintiff sues defendant for copyright infringement. Now, I tell you right now, understand one thing. Is that a federal or state case? That's a federal case. Why? Because all the copyright law in the whole United States of America is federal law. Intellectual property law is basically federal and copyright law is federal. One rule for the whole country. So that's a federal question case. Plaintiff sues defendant for copyright infringement right into the federal courts. Now, how about the plaintiff sues the defendant for a car accident? The defendant rear ends the plaintiff at a stop sign. They're both from Illinois. Do we have federal court jurisdiction or not? No, we do not. Why not? Because first, it's just a car accident. That's state law. And secondly, they're both from the same state, so there's no diversity of citizenship. But now let's change the facts in this car accident just a little bit. Let's say all the plaintiffs are citizens of Illinois. Let's say we have more than one, you know, more than one plaintiff, and we have more than one defendant. A lot of people in these cars, right? One defendant is a citizen of Indiana. Another defendant is a citizen of Illinois, and they're claiming more than $75,000 in damages. Wait, why, why is there a problem here? Wait a minute, let's look closely at this. Aren't they from different states? Oh no, look closely. All the plaintiffs are from Illinois and one of the defendants is from Illinois. There's, you don't have complete diversity. If, remember, if you've got one plaintiff and one defendant from the same state, there's no diversity. Now, go back to colonial times. They're thinking, if, if you have uh, any defendant from the same state as the plaintiff, then the courts will be fair to that side. Now let's say all the plaintiffs are from Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan, and all the defendants are from Delaware. Now we've got a corporate defendant because a lot of corporations are incorporated in Delaware. And you're claiming more than $75,000 in damages? Yes. There's no defendant from the same state as any plaintiff and the amount is over 75000 Same facts though. Number five, what if it's only $65,000 in damages? No. No diversity because the amount in question is too low. So I'll just summarize this and that'll be the end of our little slideshow. Plaintiff sues defendant for copyright infringement? Yep. Federal courts. Federal question. Jurisdiction. Plaintiff sues defendant for a car accident? No, that's going to be a state law case. But now we start changing the parties. What if we have plaintiff from Illinois and a plaintiff from Indiana um, and a defendant from Illinois, no diversity. Uh, plaintiffs from Illinois, Indiana and Michigan, etc. Diversity amount and amount in question, yes, diversity. And the last case, the amount is too low. Now, I'm not going to test you in detail on your ability to decide questions of federal and state uh, subject matter jurisdiction. You don't need to memorize this. I just want you to understand that um, a substantial number of the of the cases that the federal courts decide um, are actually decided simply because the founders thought that states couldn't be fair to litigants from other states. And so we use the federal courts to create a sense of fairness for people from different states who sue each other. The main business of the federal courts, though, is to handle cases involving federal law, and that's what we call federal court jurisdiction. But just always remember, if one person is going to sue another in this country, in almost all cases, the, the case will go to the state courts. That is the default in our system, is to go to the state courts. And the federal courts have limited uh, jurisdiction over special kinds of matters. Now, in the next... Um, uh, PowerPoint and video. Uh, I'm going to go over some of the organizational issues in more detail and focus on judicial review and try to explain to you uh, how the Supreme Court gave itself judicial review and some of the uh, major issues that they've decided and are deciding uh, in, in recent years. So that will conclude this uh, presentation.